Our conference title, The Past and the Future of the Legal Left. Uh, I guess Duncan and I are the past. You're the future. Uh, we need to, I need to try to persuade you why maybe you shouldn't quite follow Duncan down some of the routes he went. Uh, earlier, he uh, helpfully, I think, drew a distinction between the sort of approach to law of fitting it into a grand social theory, a, a big scheme of things like Marxism, fitting law into that, and studying law alternatively in itself as a kind of distinct phenomenon <coughs> from a variety of viewpoints, eclectic viewpoints, uh, which, and in a way that marks the distinction between our orientations, and I think you need to reflect upon which way the future, that's you, should be going. But I don't want to suggest that our division is so sharp as that, though I think it is ultimately that. But we share a lot in common as young, self-styled legal scholars with leftish leanings, coming up for tenure at elite institutions, Harvard, Oxford. Uh, we both had to write something to get through this, and we wanted, I think, to nail our colours to the mast. On the other hand, we didn't want to alienate those professors who were going to make the decision. Um, I, perhaps rather foolishly, produced this book called Marxism and Law, and that, that was clearly raising a few eyebrows, hackles, I think is probably nearer the truth. But fortunately, uh, HLA Hart read it, liked it, and I got the thumbs up. Duncan was more cautious, I think, in writing a manuscript called The, the Rise and Fall of Classical Legal Thought. That's uh, not so in your face, is it? That uh, uh, maybe his uh, tenure committee was more rigorous than in Oxford. Um, interestingly, what these texts have in common, what they really do have in common, is that they're a critique of leftist orthodoxy ideas from the left. That, so my book is a critique of Marxism, and rubbishing Pashukhanis and so on. And, and uh, this is a critique of a kind of leftish history which is all about Peckham, really. Peckham the judge, not the place in South London where I live. <laughs> um, so I then, I then went off to Harvard and... Uh, to study with Roberto Unger, in fact, um, uh, who clearly knew about so social theory. Uh, but I, I worked with Unger on what became the Critical Legal Studies Movement lecture and article, um, which, and it was surprising how interested he was in all the technicalities of law, which uh, I'd been taught in Oxford. And he told me not to write this book about Marxism and law, complete waste of my time. And I suspect this was influenced to some extent by Duncan, where they were talking um, much more about law in itself as a subject to study rather than fitting it into a structure. Eventually, I had the opportunity to meet Duncan uh, over double espressos and chocolate cake, I think. And my recollection is we had a lively discussion, as you'd expect, and I was presenting the view that there's a deep structure of capitalism, that law fits into this, and he was rubbishing this in every possible way. He made some <laughs> tiny concession that maybe there has to be private property in a capitalist society because of the tragedy of the commons, but that was as far as he went. He was regarding legal reasoning as functioning, it seemed to me, almost completely autonomously, uh, full of pregnant signifiers, riddled with internal contradictions, including, of course, famously, the fundamental contradiction. So I enjoyed all that. And, uh, um, and after that, I think we went our separate journeys, uh, to some extent. So, although, oddly, we then re reunited at various conferences um, where we were talking about the idea of European private law, or more accurately, the ideology of European private law. 
um, where Duncan was clearly having a wonderful time deconstructing the German law professor's systems and uh, analyses of what was going on. Um, I remember a particular occasion, I don't know if you remember this, where we, it was a conference dinner in a little restaurant outside Florence and had the dinner and all the German professors were being very learned and we were joking about. And then at the end of the meal they served this digestif, this, and it was a tiny little uh, container with this liquid in them. My neighbour, German law professor, knocked it back, and then he stood up <laughs> in horror, and it, it was like his ears were coming off, and, and he, um, and it was, it was clearly liquid gunpowder, <laughs> and he, He's, and he ran out of the restaurant and down the hill, try gasping for breath, and all his colleagues followed him, <laughs> leaving Duncan and I at the table with all these drinks, because nobody would touch it then. <laughs> um, and then, and, and then the self-styled scavenger <laughs> then sat there and proceeded to drink his way through the whole lot with no obvious effect. <laughs> Going back, to, going back to our different intellectual journeys, I'm going right back to the beginning here where we parted company, if you like. So uh, about the time I published my first article, which had what seemed to me, I must say, a splendid title, Capitalist Discipline and Corporatist Law, Duncan published an article, The Structure of Blackstone's Commentaries, which looked... I thought it was either a joke, which was possible, <laughs> or, or, or I just couldn't believe this. Not that I have any problem about writing about Blackstone. Each day I pass his statue in All Souls College, where he's enthroned like a Greek god, uh, surveying the common law, and mere mortals like myself who just sustain the law. And Blackstone was undoubtedly a smart guy. He was always short of money, and he published those commentaries, which you, um, perhaps the only person alive has ever read. Um, uh, uh, but the reason he did it was to make money, and uh, this increased his annual income eightfold. Great textbook, yes. And he's, uh, Blackstone succeeded in, indeed, imposing a structure, but this structure was of historical interest, certainly, but the question in my mind, as I approached your article, was how an analysis of that structure of the common law in 18th century England by some arch-Tory, no matter how, not you, Blackstone, <laughs> no, no, no matter how perceptive your analysis might be, how this was going to contribute, even in a tiny way, to a leftist political agenda in the 20th century. And no doubt that was the wrong question to ask, and I missed the point, though it still niggles. But, um, but what I did learn, and uh, enormously, and it has influenced my work in a way that my work's never influenced you, is, is, to, is, is, is to take legal reasoning rather more seriously and think about the concepts and images of relationships which are presented in it. And just sort of using some of your phrases, thinking about these concepts and images as universal building blocks of modern thought, and that these building blocks are used to rationalise social and political arrangements, just as Blackstone had done. And furthermore, the work could be promising if it could demonstrate that there were deep flaws in those building blocks and how they're joined together that might explain some of the failures of modern legal analysis and the difficulties encountered by anyone minded to criticise those features of modern society. And I think it's not fanciful to attribute that sort of ambition to Duncan's <coughs> more theoretical work. It's a search for deep structure of legal thought itself and discourses, including antinomies and contradictions. But there remains the question, of course, of whether once you've understood this deep structure of legal thought, the fundamental contradiction and so on, how this is going to serve leftish political purposes, or indeed any political purpose, um, 
And in the Blackstone commentaries, uh, Duncan actually has, I think it's a footnote where he says, uh, well, I, at this point, I'm just going to deconstruct, as it were, and I'm leaving the sort of uh, the project of uh, changing the world to a bit later, you know, as a sort of... Um, and so that was all right. I could see that that agenda, but I think that idea of deferral and preparation for the more sociological, structural studies, uh, that disappeared after that. And we all modify our ambitions, you'll learn about that. And uh, so it really became an analysis of how the law thinks. And I think some of that is fabulous, uh, just understanding it. Let me share with you one of my favorites. For many years I taught in jurisprudence, the distinction between rules and principles. There was an orthodox Oxford view about this. And, uh, but what Duncan says about this is, he says that you can't tell the difference between rules and principles on their face, just by looking at them. It depends upon, um, it depends on how comfortable lawyers feel with treating any norm or rule or string of words as uh, as an instrument of deductive reasoning. And that itself depends upon a particular legal consciousness. We heard this this afternoon with, uh, I thought, rather ele elegant presentation by Joanne. Um, there's the judge. He's doing something that's uh, very strange, really. It's a complete act of legal formalism. Here's the right, here's the answer. And this is a very abstract human right. And he has no difficulty in going from that very abstract human right to, as it turns out, a happy result. It doesn't always work out that way. We are in the age, I think, of uh, human rights legal formalism in Europe. It's, and where people feel very confident in being able to de deduct from very abstract rights to very concrete conclusions. Um, and I think it's interesting, I think I love Duncan's recognition that that requires a particular kind of legal consciousness which has been promoted in our society uh, by a lot of my friends who are human rights activists. And that, um, and then that leads on to as soon as you've got this formalism in human rights, what happens is you then realise you've got competing rights and then you go to balancing. And we have this incredible, uh, and it never ceases to amaze me, this belief that it's possible through legal reasoning to apply what our test of proportionality, where there's a, apparently a cost-benefit analysis where you weigh up the incommensurables of individual rights and public policy on the other, and you produce a determinate outcome. So um, I've learned a lot from Duncan, just this analysis of legal consciousness and particular parts of it. Um, and understanding how all this fits together, how different parts of legal reasoning provide mutual support, and how, how there's a there is a kind of legal consciousness at any one time, always changing. I find that very helpful in my own work. So although I remain ultimately sceptical about a leftist agenda which just looks at legal reasoning in itself, I think we need to go back to reuniting this with a broader theory of social and political change. Um, undoubtedly, we've learned a lot along the way it's been a good journey. Uh, we now understand so much better the, the paradoxes, inconsistencies, and the incoherence of the law, which conceals the deep structures of social oppression. <laughs>
It's a talk about an embarrassment of riches, the day it started with Kimberly Crenshaw and is ending with discussing your work, Duncan, so that's terrific. So, uh, as you know, I've chosen to talk in a very selfish way about my absolute favourite essay of Duncan's, the, the one on legal education as training for hierarchy, and I'm going to talk uh, with a view to both thinking about what that work, what that article meant for me personally during my career as a legal academic, and also to drawing out from the paper one of the themes which I think is really distinctive, very unusual and really important in Duncan's work, both among legal academics generally and even among critical legal scholars. And that is his concern to engage critically and very, very honestly, as well as always very amusingly, with the tricky position of the left or progressive scholar or lawyer vis-a-vis -vis legal scholarship, teaching and practice, when confronted with the tension between not merely his or her own ideals and those embedded in legal doctrines, methods or professional arrangements, but also the tension inherent in exercising the critical technique of exposing the ideological biases lurking below the surface level of neutrality or objectivity of legal judgment or argument, while remaining conscious of the vulnerability of one's own position to exactly the same deconstruction. Now, I'm just going to give a little plug to your latest article, Duncan, coming out in Law and Critique, is that right? I know you haven't talked about it in detail today, but actually I was delighted when I read it because I found that this willingness of yours to engage with this difficult issue, which has always really intrigued me and engaged me about your work, is... Um, and your willingness, I must say, not only to explore the intellectual dimensions of it, but the sort of affective dimensions of it, is really very central to this latest paper of yours, uh, in which you make a sort of fascinating suggestion that what you call a hermeneutics of suspicion characterises the competing positions in legal scholarship and sort of amounts to a kind of psychoanalytic projective identification in which we're all projecting our own anxieties about the vulnerability of the objectivity of our own position onto our, onto our critics. And I'd love to be debating that with you, but I'm going to leave it aside in favour of talking about this wonderful 1982 article. And I'm just going to preface that by mentioning a few of the other things that I just think are very uh, noteworthy and precious about Duncan's career and Duncan himself, a few words of personal appreciation. Um, I'm, I'm tempted in view of Hugh's Florence story to just preface this with my own personal favourite Duncan alcohol, or it should, be, <laughs> should be Duncan and Nicky alcohol <laughs> story, which, um, which illustrates something about Duncan, which is his extreme uh, consideration for others. I seem to remember we had the pleasure, David and I, of having you to stay for a night or so many years ago when you were coming to do a talk at Birkbeck. Is that right? I can't think why we weren't putting, why you poor thing had to stay with us and not be put in a decent hotel. <laughs> Knowing Birkbeck, we'd probably sort of drunk away the, the departmental funds or something. But I remember asking you what you would like, like to drink. And among the menu of options, I put to you as a gin and tonic. And you said, yes, you'd like a gin and tonic. And then I discovered we hadn't got any tonic. At which point, so I said, it's fine, I'll just nip round to the shop. And you said, no, no, don't worry about that, the gin will do fine. <laughs> I can still remember the, I really can still remember the hangover. <laughs> I really can. <laughs> okay, so here are uh, four things I want to mention about Duncan before I get to the paper. Um, first of all, his just legendary generosity to doctoral students and young scholars generally. I mean, I, I think this is really nicely... Um, uh, reflected in that I, I was talking to someone who's actually here now who was at the conference I was co-hosting at LSE today and who said, oh, I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to leave now because I've really got to go to the, the conference at SOAS in honour of Duncan Kennedy. And I said, oh, were you a student of Duncan's? And he said, no, but my supervisor was. And that's enough to make me feel as though I I'm feel a great loyalty to Duncan. And that's the kind of way in which Duncan's personal commitment to and sort of intellectual engagement with his students just is a gift that's been passed on uh, so widely. So thank you. Um, secondly, uh, Duncan has, as we all know, a really extraordinary ability to combine a prodigious set of skills as a doctrinal lawyer 
with a really deep interest in the big picture within which those intricacies of legal reasoning, which he's so good at expounding, proceed. Indeed, his detailed critical practice has proceeded in the light of this sort of broad periodization that one could call virtually Weberian in its scope and ambition. So while maintaining his interest in the intricacies of how legal arguments are put together and organize their own criteria of persuasiveness or legitimacy, he never loses sight of the impact of those broader socio-political forces on the way in which those distinctive forms of legal power operate, on whom among legal actors and others they empower or disempower. And of course, that broad breadth of his work is also informed by a really sort of enviably wide range of reading across the social sciences and humanities. It's hard to find anything that you're not interested in, actually, Duncan. I think that's one of your great secrets. Um, thirdly, um, Duncan's consistent interest not only in the history of the common law but also in civilian and other legal traditions, um, a really decisive rejection of the parochialism which unfortunately pervades so much doctrinal legal scholarship. And then last, <coughs> but very definitely not least, his capacity to combine a really intensely serious engagement with a pervasive sense of fun as well as of irony, and not excluding self-irony. Let's face it, Duncan is the genius of the cheeky title. My favourites being the article I've chosen to talk about, along with the first chapter of Sexy Dressing, itself, of course, a strong contender. I imagine Joanne might have had something to say about that. Uh, so this chapter one is Radical Intellectuals in American Culture and Politics, or my talk at the Gramsci Institute. <laughs> Was it serious? It just always makes me smile. Um, so it's hard, I wrote here, it's hard to think of another male academic, well, let me just rephrase that, it's hard to think <laughs> of another academic of any you know, description at all, gender or otherwise, however impeccable their progressive credentials, who could have got away with publishing a book with that title in 1993. And yet again, I, I think myself that the secret lay uh, in the seriousness with which you engaged, particularly in the last chapter of that uh, book, with the issues being raised by feminist scholars, and did so in a way that was both had your trademark boldness, but I think built be beneath the boldness I read as being beguilingly self-critical. So that brings me nicely to legal education as training for hierarchy. So this paper was published in my second year as uh, a law teacher, but I confess I didn't actually encounter it until 1984 or 1985 when Hugh and I were involved with a few of our more open-minded Oxford colleagues in a study group in which we were reading some of the key papers emerging from the critical legal studies movement. One colleague, by the way, <coughs> when invited to join the group, declined on the basis that he didn't attend events for which a party card was necessary. <laughs> Things in this country very rarely got as polarised as I think they did in, in the US, but uh, it was sometimes there was a, a lot of suspicion around, though certainly not hermeneutics of suspicion. That would have been far too exotic for Oxford in those days. So um, to use a technical term here, I was just blown away by this article. Um, because it seemed to me to put its finger on a whole host of sort of painful spots in my own experience of being a law student and a law teacher. The student's experience of having one's knowledge regularly disqualified until one had learnt to tailor it according to the prevailing conventions. The subtle feeling that certain intuitive ways of responding to issues were being sort of educated out of one in a way which implied some kind of moral or mo emotional loss. Um, just as a, a bit of colour here, as an undergraduate, my trusts lectures were introduced by the lecturer by the statement that the lectures would be based on two premises, that what the Queen in Parliament enacted was law and that the Ong <laughs> Oxford English Dictionary was always correct. <laughs> it's true, I'm not making it up. So that gave a fairly clear steer, steer on what level of critical engagement was being expected. We were definitely in thinking behind the bicycle sheds terrain there. Um, but more opposite to my then position as I was reading the piece as a young law teacher, I also recognised 
the uncomfortable um, feeling of sort of bad faith as I struggle to introduce my students to critical ideas, for example, about the law policy distinction, which you talk about in the paper, uh, while also trying to ensure that their chances in an exam system over which I had absolutely no control would not be impeded. And even leaving aside that sort of question about exams, I felt a deeper discomfort, which I think I can best describe by my memories of over many years teaching first-year criminal law, uh, with generations of students looking at me quizzically. I think some of them actually looked quite sorry for me, as I carefully introduced reasons to think that the very standards, understandings and protocols which they had struggled to learn at the hands of other tutors and textbooks were not all that they seemed and were appropriately subject to some fairly subject-searching critique. So, to me, Duncan's message that the whole edifice of legal reasoning was nonsense was accordingly reassuring but also worrying, liberating and also a bit paralysing. So, it was intriguing to reread the piece. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of the last intervening time working on historical and comparative issues. And I did wonder whether I'd think, oh, OK, it was, it was 1982 or it was Harvard Law School. Um, and I think it's true that, to say that in rereading it, I was, um, I was probably more struck by the US-UK contrast than I was at the time for the simple reason that when I first read it, I didn't have any experience of studying or teaching in the US. <laughs> Nor did I, at that stage as I do now, have personal experience of the Harvard Law School gym, a space saturated in contradictory unwritten rules and one crying out, Duncan, for inclusion in any updated deconstruction of Harvard legal education. Notwithstanding the creation of a number of very self-consciously critical and socio-legal departments here, Nonetheless, teaching against the grain is still very, very hard. I remember William Twining saying famously at an early Birkbeck exam board, um, you know, for a critical law school, you're teaching an awful lot of black letter law. But so notwithstanding the differences and some pluralization of what counts as good legal scholarship, at least in the intervening time, the paper still seems to me to identify with almost painful accuracy what we might call sort of echoing Hughes' title, the deep structure of legal education and the dilemmas for the critical law professor who likes to, indeed has to, for psychological survival, believe in his or her own good faith while appreciating both our own limited room for manoeuvre and the tools available to us, in effect, the deconstruction of our opponent's position as ideological and the implicit representation of our own position as truthful, just, or undistorted, bearing a close family resemblance to those which are the object of our critique. I think you call this in the latest paper, and I love this phrase, the existential delicacy of the jurist situation. So thank you, Duncan, in conclusion, because your paper gave me the reassurance that I was far from being alone and a framework with which to discuss the issues with sympathetic colleagues like Hugh. Um, it isn't so clear it gave me too many uh, steers on how to emerge <laughs> from the dilemma. Um, and I guess what I took away from it and still do um, is the knowledge with its acknowledgement of the sort of huge pressure on one not to constantly be putting up one's hand to uncertainty or perplexity. It's just that one has to resist and have the courage to do that and say when one isn't sure and be reflexive and honest about this existential delicacy. And I think your own capacity to embody and yet transcend the contradictions is manifest in your having perfected over so many years what one might call an exemplary practice, indeed aesthetic, I would say, of engaged resistance and successful confidence rating, uh, raising at the heart of perhaps the sort of quintessentially elite law school of the world. And it seems to me that you've done that not only because of your intellectual brilliance, but also your generosity, your honesty, and the self-confidence which has allowed you to be so funny, because it does take a lot of confidence to be funny, and I'm so grateful that you have been. So um, while expressing deep scepticism, deep scepticism, 
about whether Duncan can ever really retire from the fray, as opposed to the HLS scene of engagement, I salute your stature as the embodiment of a fundamental contradiction. <laughs> Enfant terrible and international treasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for such rich and exciting papers. It was really hard to keep an eye on the clock. Um, so now Gina will provide us with some comments. Thanks, questions. thanks, Prabha. Um, well, I'll probably start by saying I feel a bit overwhelmed. Amazing array of papers and, and day. Uh, I'm going to focus on actually the stories that we tell ourselves, perhaps because most of the papers today have been stories. Um, but before I do that, uh, thanks, of course, to Nima for organising today and Tara, who's uh, been working hard in the background all along as well. Uh, and thank you to the three panellists that I'm really honoured to uh, be a discussant for uh, today. So as I said, I want to talk about the stories uh, we tell ourselves. Um, that is not what we do out there, but how we create, I guess, an effective community in here. Um, so I'm going to um, outline specific responses to each paper, um, and a question <coughs> each, before uh, a, a more general question that I, uh, I guess, hope all of us might engage in. Um, so Hugh, thank you for your paper and your stories. Um, I was stuck by the, struck by the way that you did use memory. Uh, I had the advantage of seeing the papers in advance. <laughs> so, um, But I was struck by the way you used memory, and then, of course, of across today, everybody's used memory of stories uh, in con conjunction with either reading or working with Duncan, um, a narrative to tell a legal history. Uh, and, I, and actually talking about stories is not my own idea. I'm drawing on the wonderful work of uh, Claire Hemmings at the LSE and her book, Why Stories Matter. And in her book, she talks about narratives of loss, progress and return. And it's, if you reflect across today and uh, Hugh's uh, paper as well, we see these stories of lost progress and return of how the, we tell the story of how we got here or what the past and future of critical legal studies might be and what it is or what it ought to be. Um, so my question here is about linking and thinking about storytellings, narratives, highlighting lost progress and return as actually a, putting a role for affect in what we do. And of course, the last panel talked about, maybe avoided uh, talking about emotion, uh, although Duncan did pick up on this and talked about passions as well. And I feel not just in the words, but also in the way the papers, especially on this panel, but across the day, have elicited a certain <coughs> amount of passion in the way they were presented, is about narrative and affect. Um, so Hugh, my question is, how do we engage and understand the deep structures of law and both embrace and yet understand the way that we use affect because it strikes me that we draw colleagues readers methods towards us and away uh, to produce an account of law and i just wonder if you might play with both the tensions and the possibilities of that and the consciousness of what we're doing um, and for me, that links in nicely to Nikki's paper. Thank you, uh, Nikki. Um, I've written in my notes, pull out effective dimension, critical techniques, vulnerabilities, willingness, exposing bias, uh, worrying, liberating, intriguing. So all words that, again, seem to me to connect back something in the method, something in the telling, something in the narrative that, that used affect. Um, and of course, uh, connected then I think nicely, not just about our research, but that our investment as teachers as well. Um, so how do we as teachers and writers account for and respond to our effective techniques? We convince, as you were saying, law students or we draw them in. Um, and I guess it was really nice in your paper how you connect that to Duncan's ideas around uh, projective identification or perhaps uh, at that point when uh, affect it also meets desire. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, I guess my question is, do we need to emerge from this dilemma or do we need to gain more skills perhaps just in naming it and seeing it? So rather than a method of what do we, how do we apply these techniques to look at law or out there, can we use these techniques to look at ourselves and how we create a community? Um, and if we talk about desire, then I guess 
there's a turn to psychoanalysis at that point, um, which raises some questions about masculine closure that I think are perhaps embedded in the projective identification that I would be interested in your thoughts. Um, so the masculine subject, and I, I obviously don't mean men, but the masculine subject of psychoanalysis that pursues competition, separation, severance, over con connection and affect. So I wonder if you could bring some of those themes out of your work. And Roy, thank you, because I'd, I'd seen the first two papers and I was thinking about affect and then uh, your paper, which gave us hope, faith, style, narrative, personal, political, the worm of nothingness, despair, critique, passions, perspectives, resistance, um, and the politics of organizing your own people, which, which thank you. Um, it seemed really important stories that you told us today. Uh, and your personal story embodied precisely my questions about the first two papers. How do we use effective dimensions as theorists? Um, but perhaps also how do effective dimensions also emerge in our curriculum um, as teachers, which I think is perhaps what you're describing as an attempt to achieve and transform in, at Tel Aviv Law School. And how do these effective dimensions create, tell, or appear in the stories that we tell about our own methods? Uh, and that's, and I, so, I, so this is a room of critical, race critical, legal, feminist scholars, post-colonial scholars, um, and how do we embrace, deny, this isn't just for you, this is for everyone, <laughs> deny, distance, inter internalize, reject, the, the deep structures of critical legal scholars, how do we, and this, I think the projective, the pr projective identification is, an, is a story of avoidance of that, looking at that effective community that we create, perhaps. So they're my specific questions. I'm sorry that I don't think they're very easy or probably got any answers, but I wonder if we could reflect on them. And then I have one more question, which I'd really like to open out to the floor, uh, especially to my students who I see here, but also colleagues, I guess. And ask a question about why SOAS, uh, or, or how SOAS, and maybe Nima wants to pick up this point as well. Uh, can or does the work of critical legal scholarship have relevance for the work of this law school? Um, what type of projective identification occurs when we deploy methods built into our response to European and US legal models? How does that matter? at SOAS if they're the tools that we use in our study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East? Um, it's not a negative question, but I do think we have to ask it and, and talk about that here in this specific law school, um, what projective identification occurs when, when we do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. So I'll let the speakers respond, and maybe then Duncan would want to Intervene, if you, if you so wish. Um, yeah, so way outside my comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> That's called emotion. Uh, <laughs> <open us. laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, I think I, think I, I uh, think I would have hope, which I think we, we do need to, so I, you know, I, irrepressible hope things are going to get better. And, but a lot of my leftist friends, are, you know, they're, 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 they're Eeyore characters, you know. It's, it's always just getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and, worse and, and there's a <coughs> structure which is going to make things, you know, international financial capitalism is going to ruin us all and impoverish us and so on. And, uh, um, and, but I, I don't have that, and I don't think Duncan does. You have, and nor does Roberto Ongo. You've got a hope, and, and think that um, in little ways, in the workplace or wherever it might be, that it's possible sometimes to resist, sometimes to make changes, and um, but sometimes to be a leader and just say, this is how, where I think we want to go, and you may be lucky. And more, the rest of the faculty may follow uh, with you. I think I think that's important as to keep hope, and uh, I said you always have that. Um, the other thing is I think you need good friends to uh, sustain this. 
deeply as you hope, Vicky and I used to share our angst uh, yeah. over a glass of wine <laughs> once a week. <laughs> uh, sometimes more. Sometimes more. And, the, and there were many difficult issues we were coping with, the hierarchies, the, uh, the fact that the uh, legal academy was almost exclusively male in those days, uh, and uh, that meant uh, for women working there particularly, but, uh, but for us all, I think, and I think that, that local community and it being an effective community in the mm. sense you're sharing issues and problems and, uh, and hoping to support each other. That was that's always been a, an important part of my experience to have have a, a group of good friends who I could uh, uh, share my problems with <laughs> in uh, some sort of confessional sometimes. Um, so yeah, I don't. Today, yes, I was telling stories today, and, um, and but that was partly, I think, the occasion. I'm not sure I do stories so often, <laughs> but, but it's important to understand that that is one of the, the, the deep structures of uh, the legal consciousness of common lawyers. We love stories. We tell the facts of the case, of what happened, in a way that our friends across the channel uh, they, they, they don't. They talk in abstract concepts which they're going to use through deductive reasoning to apply. That's part of our legal consciousness. And once one's aware of that, that narrative style of the common law, uh, one has to know, I mean, I, I mean, you just have to use it to tell the story slightly differently and uh, to do the used to call the deviationist doctrine to explain things uh, in a slightly different way from the popular orthodox view. So stories are, are, our, are our business, I think, and uh, we need to think about how to tell good, better stories about the world. Terrific. Nikki. Well, thank you very much for your comments, Gina. And um, I think my to, to go straight to your question, and I'd like to sort of build on some of the things Hugh's just said. Um, do we need to emerge from this dilemma, you mm -hmm. ask, or is it just a question of being more reflexive about it? And I think, I, I don't think there is. I, I, I'm sorry if I made it sound a bit like sort of Hegelian, and it's going to be the, this and the that, and then there'll be this nice resolution. I don't think there is a, 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 a neat exit, but um, I think being reflexive about it is, is at least a step. But to, to proceed on the theme of the affective and the narrative, um, you know, I, I very much agree with Hugh that you know, friendship is a huge part of how we can be effective as teachers and as people who survive with <coughs> different views from those that are of the mainstream in our profession. Sorry. Um, and um, I think that that's I'm, I'm I'm very bad at hope. I'll I'll am I one of the eels, Hugh? <laughs> I'm sure I have been occasionally over, especially in the deepest, darkest, malest Oxford days. I think I probably was a female version of the eel. Of course, she said hastily. Um, but I but I suppose here's another dilemma for me. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I think I don't have much difficulty with the sort of bringing the affective into my work. And I w think that the way I teach, the way I have always taught, is through affect very largely and through building some kind of relationship with my students. And I think that's been, uh, that carries its own dilemmas because um, the truth is that uh, much as we or identify with the deconstruction of the hierarchy of legal education. There is a sort of inevitable, you know, it's, there's no point in pretending that it's a completely equal or non-differentiated relationship. Um, and setting that up in a way that produces sufficient confidence on the part of uh, students while being, while as it were, putting oneself in a vulnerable position, which I feel one, one should in order to 
communi communicate properly and learn is actually quite a <coughs> quite a trick, and I don't think I've always <laughs> done it successfully by any manner of means. But I do think on the, the sort of broader friendship front, I think we've been incredibly lucky, those of us on the legal left, in this period, partly on the back of the work of people like Duncan and Kim and the people who were there early and people in earlier generations who were doing uh, other kinds of against-the-grain work because for all that I'm a bit of an Eeyore, uh, most of my career I have actually felt as though I've been part of a set of affective groups of sisterhoods with the feminist uh, legal studies uh, community with with critical legal studies, and it's really kept me going because I don't think I would have stayed in a law school without that, to be honest. I've always been a pretty reluctant lawyer, um, and I, you know, I wouldn't have made it. I just wouldn't have made it, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. So, a, a word about the effective dimension in organizing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have anything very clever to say about this. It's, uh, except that it's absolutely crucial, at least as far as, as relatively small groups are concerned. I mean, it's almost everything uh, as far as relatively small groups are concerned. And I think that the, it, there's a danger, and I think it, it uh, happens to a lot of us while we're, while we're doing our while we're doing our dissertations, when we're so deep into the books that we forget that there are other people, um, there's a danger to to forget that, especially when we're uh, when we're very young if we, and if we don't have uh, thriving enough communities around us. But once you are actually part of, you know, if you're lucky, you're already part of a community while you're a graduate student, and uh, and then you know. But when you uh, when you get to a faculty, if it's not working as a community, um, there's there's nothing but the effective dimension that is going to change that, in in a sense, because the a reasoned argument about why people should behave in a community-oriented fashion is. You know, it's fine, but it's like saying, you know, we should generate the ideal speech situation and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, right, great. We all agree. Um, so so it's, the, it's the most important thing, but there's no, I mean, and maybe somewhere out there somewhere, people are actually teaching the skill or you can get better at it. I have no idea. Uh, my experience of it is that it's mostly a question of luck and a question of putting in time into your relationships the way you would put in time to your books. Uh, they're not, you know, we all know this about, about friendship, and sometimes we don't know it in advance that, that, it, uh, that it includes the workplace or relationships with students, but putting in that kind of time is, it's part of, it's part of making life. It's not some, uh, it's not some, it's not an addition. Mm. It's it's part of the core. Thank you. So uh, I have a few building up. Um, so I'll collect a couple of questions and then revert back either to the panelists or then address the question that Gina put on the table for the SOAS law community. So Does Brenna, do you want to? Leave a little bit of time for Duncan to respond. No, absolutely. Uh, at the end, so he can <laughs> put it all together for us. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, thanks very much for all of those papers, and Gina also for her comments. And I wanted to um, just make two quick points and then and pose a question about the narrative form to Duncan. and Oh, I was going to say Kimberly, but she's <laughs> leaving the room. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first point is that I think I wanted to just say I think it's really important to complicate um, this question around intellectual traditions when we talk about American ones and European ones versus other ones because um, I think sometimes in making those distinctions there's a certain kind of erasure that's going on which I feel sort of troubling. One is that you know when we talk about American intellectual traditions are we thinking about that um, minus um, black radical traditions, or when we talk about British intellectual you know, uh, um, uh, bodies of work, are we thinking about that 
um, you know, minus uh, black British cultural studies. And so, you know, that, that's one kind of point. Or, or indeed, if we think about North American intellectual traditions, are we thinking about that minus critical indigenous scholarship? Right? So, you know, what does the West versus the rest really mean when we think about that? And the second point is when we think about European philosophy, I think it's also important to remember all of the work that's been done to show how race, which is always a gendered concept, you know, uh, and colonial histories are ever present within the canon of continental philosophy. So I just wanted to mention that because I think um, we, we really need to bear those points in mind when we have this conversation about which philosophies and which traditions we're, we're using. Um, the question I had about narrative form is sort of related to this, and I wanted to ask Duncan or anyone else for that matter to reflect on the use of narrative form um, in Duncan's work and its relationship to critical race theory. Because when I think about narrative form as a mode of legal reasoning, I think of critical race theory, which was really you know, the body of work which you know, pioneered it as a way of doing law. And you know, in Duncan's earlier work, he, I think, um, in, in one uh, essay sort of talks about how critical race theory is some of the most exciting novel, you know, uh, legal scholarship that's being produced in the U.S. context. Um, so I, I, I just want, I think it's very important. I found it interesting that the whole conversation about narrative uh, form took place without a mention of critical race theory. And so maybe it's my North American origins that, uh, you know, sort of my um, uh, uh, I feel reactive to that. But uh, in any case, those are the points I wanted to make. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Virginia. Um, thanks. Uh, Virginia Montevallo, UCL. Um, I enjoyed all the presentations enormously. Uh, I, but I, I think there's a question that needs to be asked to all the speakers and the earlier speakers. I think I, I have missed the definition of what is the legal left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think many of us here, some of us here may disagree on what it is. Um, so I, I wondered, so I understand that it has to do with the criticism of formalism in law, you know. Uh, so. This is certainly something that we all here perhaps dislike. But then, so, and Duncan earlier spoke about methodology. So, it's, so um, legal left in, for Duncan is a lot of things, one of which is a particular methodology to, to, to use and criticize the law. But I wonder personally whether it's also about substantive values and what are these substantive values. And we haven't spoken very explicitly, at least. I mean, they are implied in all the presentations. Hugh said that human rights are nice, and he likes the uh, activists that work on these issues, but, uh, um, uh, <laughs> but that uh, here we need a more general political theory. And I like that. Uh, so, but I, 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 so I wonder what are these uh, um, values that uh, bring the legal left together, if there is such a thing. Um, yeah, please introduce yourself. I'm Sia, I'm a Zilla's PhD student. Um, just a quick question, bring it back to affect and to make you more uncomfortable. Um, um, it's oh yeah, um, most of you guys, when the affect idea came up, you just talked about your own relationships within academia. Um, just to bring it back, how about the work or the role of affect in your scholarship or in the way that you try to relate into your wider political projects? If you can reflect on that. Terrific. Any other questions? Um, so would you like to briefly respond, and then Duncan can, can speak to any of the themes that were addressed to you? Let, let everybody answer. Yeah. yeah. Would you? Any of you? Well, maybe I could say just one thing about the role of affect in, um, in writing and what you choose to, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we all work on something that has some kind of uh, psychological complexity for us. So I leave, I leave you to ponder the fact that I work on responsibility. <laughs> but I guess that I was struck when I worked on a biography um, and revealed a lot about the affective life of the, the person I was writing about, the man I was writing about, that some... Um, some readers understood that to be in some way diminishing of his intellectual stature, mm -hmm. which, which is um, an idea I both find ludicrous, but also one that is really actually important to counter. Um, so I, I think that um, 
certainly that that's been a very important thing for me thinking about that that uh, audience side of it so thank, thanks for raising it the other questions are really good questions as well they're very hard ones so I'm going to leave them to the other panellists and to Duncan <laughs> observation and I think uh, and, and maybe that's been an omission but I, I think that uh, we're kind of been focusing on, on Duncan's contribution and, and, we, and I think his contribution as it were as an answer to that question is that uh, it's all much more complicated than you think. No. And, the, um, and the, if you say, well, as you would, uh, you know, human rights are a jolly good thing, uh, you would, uh, and I'm not going to disagree uh, with you on that, but then, but then the sort of argument, but then the sort of argument he might produce to say, yes, but the human rights is good, but it, it closes down other other values and so on, the rights come to the fore and they have great exclusionary force in legal reasoning very often and we begin to forget about other issues um, that need to be considered like uh, distributive issues about, uh, about wealth and that sort of thing, focus on dignity and property and things like this and these other values get somehow marginalised and suppressed. So it's true we haven't talked explicitly about values, and perhaps that's a mistake, but uh, I think uh, this is an occasion where we are thanking the master for alerting us to the pitfalls of talking about that. That is a very simple way. I have a very primitive idea about what, what the legal left is, which is just that there are lots and lots of uh, political conflicts and, and policy conflicts, and on any number of them, um, when, when that argument is going on, there's, there's a left and a right, and it's pretty easy to identify. Um, and so I don't have a big stake in trying to say, here's the total position of the left. It's these 14 propositions. Um, it's, but in the, in the given arguments, it's, uh, I, I don't find it difficult to to figure out what the uh, you know I want to say what my place is in them. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that there aren't that it isn't worthwhile at some points to figure out uh, what the border is between some kind of reformism that's too soft and that you know all all the questions of the implications of your position. Take human rights for instance, right? It's good for us to talk about to the extent to which human rights discourse and human rights activism uh, actually meshes with a lot of ne neoliberalism, right? With uh, you know basic opposition to to state programs that are geared towards structurally changing uh, questions of poverty, for instance. So those are good discussions to have at times, uh, and. And I think that the, there's so much work to be done in just articulating positions within given conflicts that a totalizing theory of where the, where the border is between left and what isn't left uh, seems to me less, less productive. And when, when all that work is done, maybe, maybe figuring out where the border lies will, will for me, become more interesting. But. No, I think we can, yeah. Maybe you can address the questions posed to you, and then we can okay. go back to the SOAS question. So I guess the question addressed to me was about critical race theory and narrative. 
uh, and maybe affect. So uh, I think uh, that it was a mistake to think that critical race theory had invented a new form of legal scholarship that was based on narrative. I don't think it was um, a good way for critical race theorists to formulate their program. So they were writing incredible articles, one after the other, on a wide range of different issues of race. And obviously, this was a situation, um, and it still is, in which critical race theory is a very interesting, actual, small movement among um, black uh, left intellectuals with some allies in other uh, minority communities. Um, and my view of my relationship to them was that I was a white guy organizing white guys, and organize your own community in part meant don't think that you're going to organize black people in legal academia. The question is, can we ally with them, and what should the basis of alliance be? And there was no reason to think that they were, there was nothing sort of sanctified about the way they did it any more than there was anything sanctified about the way we did it. But it was really hot and fantastically interesting to work with critical race theory in its emergence. Um, I always thought that the idea of narrative as a kind of powerful alternative to the white male doctrinal position was a mistake. I thought it was a mistake because it was just reifying and exaggerating a version of black identity against white identity, which was completely playing into a very older idea about how, the, how they should construct the public image of their position. So we're into narrative. That means that we are not formalists. That means that we are more into affect. That means that we reject uh, rigid binaries of logical reasoning and recognize all these other dimensions of it. Uh, but as a matter of fact, the best critical race theory work was just as doctrinally intense and just as conceptually oriented j easily as anything that was being done by the white boy mainstream. So the, that choice was, I thought, partly defensive. That is, they were being attacked really hard and the assertion of something unique about their procedure played a tactical role in their defense, which I regarded as not a great idea. Having said that, that's about the way a dissenting new oppositional movement that's trying to create momentum in the academy and protect their uh, ability to institutionalize, because there's the threat is always that you're going to get fired or marginalized as you begin to organize in an oppositional way. So, but that was their decision. So it's a very complicated strategic decision. Um, and it worked pretty well, pretty well. A separate question is the narrative affect idea. So there, there are, I really do, I'm interested in a way that I think is unusual, but I don't see why more people aren't interested in it in trying to get into doctrinal or historical writing a thread which is both a narrative thread and a deliberately attempt to raise the pulse or lower the pulse to get the reader's affects flowing. And I try to write that way as a very specific aesthetic agenda. And Roy read some examples of sloganeering that were designed to, so, um, teaching from the left my anecdotage, that, that's an idea to get some moment of emotion from the reader before we even begin. And I, I think that that's really a good thing to do, and I think a lot of critical race theory writing does it too. We're not talking about narrative as a new form of legal scholarship, but just as an incredibly important technique, which I really believe in. Now, Nikki mentioned her biography. The thing about her biography that's amazing is both it is an example of a biography which is both intensely conscious of the emotional, private emotional life of H.L.A. Hart, but also the narrative itself is very strongly evocative of emotion in the reader because she manages to get at the way his life is in some way exemplary for other people reading about it. And that's to evoke the affect. You don't have to use an affect word. You don't have to say passion. You don't have to say rage. The basic idea is that you construct the narrative so that it grips the reader because the reader thinks, oh, shit, you know, wow, ouch, mm. and in some mode of identification. So I don't, I think that, I th just think it would be good if more uh, relatively highly structured doctrinal scholarship 
try to deploy those techniques. But as, and as Roy said, so Roy puts it all, compl I completely agree with what Roy said about the incredible significance of personal relationships in movement building. I think it's over and over again underestimated how much of movement change and evolution is the random consequence of the capacities of leaders who just emerge to establish that one-on-one -on -one contact that then can be built into some kind of collective thing. And I think it's deeply, deeply about friendship and love, as a matter of fact, um, and very complicated emotionally, because it's also about resentment and envy and jealousy and anger within any attempt to create a serious network of people who are going to act together. So th I think that's true. But I, don't, I, I really think that it's also perfectly plausible that the most striking legal writers, great legal writers of the past, and I think in the American context, Oliver Wendell Holmes is a very striking example. Their rhetoric is designed to get your pulse racing. It's completely objective. But the idea is some twist or some contradiction or some side comment, throwaway comment, gives away the game that there's a lot at stake. And I don't see why we should not collectively write more that way. I think it would be great if we did. I guess we're getting to the end. So maybe I can make a very general comment. I, I don't want myself at this point to give three comments on the three amazing papers, but I, uh, maybe but I, I guess what I'd like to say is this. So this has been an amazing experience for me as the legal, the past of the legal left. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I've got to say something more about the legal left. I, there are, my approach is more like, like um, Royce. I don't have, uh, in general, I, the problem is not to figure out, for me, whatever side I'm on, that's the legal left. <laughs> so, so my first question is, what side am I on? And that might be fairly difficult to resolve in a particular case, but once that's resolved, it answers the larger question. I've spent no time in my life wondering about what the legal left is on that theory. And I've, then the question is, who agrees? And then at that point, there's some people who agree that we're on this side, and therefore the legal left, and then we can really strangle each other, but only at that point. So that's the point where we begin to do that. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Uh, let me just say that this is the whole thing, and this is addressed to Nimmer. So Nimmer was my student. Um, he's a student who, with whom I've worked very closely, and I feel quite identified with him. Um, but this is an incredible gift, Nimmer, uh, an amazing organizing thing. All the six presentations and the two comments were wonderful. And they do sort of, I feel somewhat overwhelmed by the intensity of the niceness and the praise. So it's actually somewhat difficult to deal with. It's very, very, very makes me incredibly happy. This has just made me ecstatically euphoric, a little euphoric line without any substance <coughs> of any kind. So I mean. Controlled substances, or <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and uh, just I just want to thank you. I mean, you were so nice to me. You alone and Raf managed to preserve a little bit of very healthy distance, uh, <laughs> but barely. <laughs> um, so I just wish for all of you that you might have in your life an experience like this. It's really, really fulfilling. And Nimmer, thank you very much. I mean, Costas said correctly that the gift problem is, is a problem. The gift is a problem. I just hope that in some other future thing, I can give back some of the good feeling that I've gotten out of this whole thing. So thank you a million times, Nimmer. Thank you so much. Uh, it's only a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you for this panel, for, uh, for all the panels. Mostly thank you, Duncan, for coming here, skipping another day in Paris uh, to come to London. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to host you here and uh, uh, think about and reread your articles and again and again. And hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation. Obviously, the question, uh, what is the legal left? Is it synonymous with Duncan or not? And, uh, the past and the future, it's only a beginning of a conversation. This is, was not meant to be a, uh, a conclusive conversation. It's only one way 
of having this conversation and hopefully we'll have more and more of these from different aspects and angles and that was uh, only the uh, modest uh, goal of this uh, event. I would like to thank uh, Tara, uh, uh, the wonderful organizer of this conference. Without you, nothing would have been possible. Um, I would like to thank the volunteers, Sia, and the other PhDs. I would like to thank uh, those of you who traveled uh, uh, from far away to uh, come here. I would like to thank, uh, uh, finally, uh, the head of school, uh, Paul Kohler, for supporting and uh, uh, making this event, for this event and making it uh, possible. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you also for uh, uh, bearing with us all this time. Uh, you have been a wonderful audience, and hopefully we'll see, we'll see you in a future event. Have a good night.